Okay. All right. Welcome. Yes, thank you. Good morning. My name is Howard White. Today we're going to discuss the construction and flight of a replica Newport 28, 1917 Newport 28, something I did some years back, and I'm anxious to share this with you. Before we get started in that, let's open up in prayer, if you don't mind. Well, Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this opportunity to gather together in peace and harmony and to worship you, our Son, God's Son. I ask that you be with this group. Amen. All right, let's see if I get this all done right here. I, I, a little background on this aircraft, if you please. When America entered World War I, it had been going on for almost three years at that time, America did not have any combat aircraft in its inventory at all. They had trainers, they had some civilian models they were playing with, about 500 aircraft total in their inventory, none of them of the standard that was required for war. So they, were, they had to beg, borrow, and steal, if you will, from the Allies, the UK, France, and so on, for aircraft to fly, and they had to take what was offered. They were fortunate enough to get a hold of the Newport 28. It had passed its trials, but it was superseded by the SPAD-13, an upgraded model of the SPAD aircraft. And everyone wanted the SPAD, so production went to making the SPAD, and the Newport was relegated to the U.S. squadrons, which were newly forming. Now, there were American flyers in France, flying in French and British squadrons, but this is the first time American squadrons were being formed, and they were flying French aircraft. And, and the exploits of these pilots it was amazing. Uh, they were like rock stars of their time. I mean, there had never been anything like this in the world before. Fighter pilots and aerial combat. It was all brand new. And so men like Alan Winslow or Doug Chapman and Quentin Roosevelt and Eddie Rickenbacker, these were household names at the time. And you can go back in the archives and the stacks and read these little articles in the, in the papers and they would talk about what they ate or what their latest mission was, or they just returned from a patrol, or if they had a combat victory, they would all record that. It would be front page news for these people, particularly in the hometown where they came from. So these names were legendary at the time, and it's unfortunate we've lost track of them in some cases, but aerial combat today is because of what these men invented and, and practiced and were successful at doing at the time back in the, in the early uh, 20th century. So I, I admire them, and, and the technology for these aircraft. I mean, if you think about it, the first flight was 1903 with the Wright brothers. And in that time frame between 1903 and 1914 when the war started, technology just exploded in flight. But no one really knew aeronautics. So it was a lot of, let's try this, let's try that, let's see what works, let's see what doesn't work. And slowly the fundamentals were learned in a, in a really a pretty rudimentary way, but the aircraft development was just at a fantastic pace. You know, who has the best one would shift from month to month sometimes. So what we have here in these aircraft at this time frame are really relatively primitive by our standards. And it amazes me that men will willingly climb into these things knowing that they may not take the stress of a, a loop or a roll or a high speed dive. They may come apart in the air and yet they still did this. And I just thought it was absolutely amazing courage on their part to, to do this. They believed in what they were doing and, and uh, I celebrate them to this day. The Newport 28 is oftentimes considered by many ex experts as the most beautiful aircraft that was ever produced during World War I. I won't argue with that point. I, I, I often get questioned, you know, why this airplane? Uh, why not build something else? Um, well, I, lifetimes ago, I used to own a cabinet shop in Colorado, and a man came into my shop, and he was just recently purchased uh, some resort property with cabins and stuff on it, and he was going to turn each cabin into a themed cabin. He had a Victorian cabin, he had uh, you know, all kinds of you know, designs, and he wanted a World War I pilot's bunkhouse type headquarters cabin, and he wanted an airplane out front, and he wanted a Newport 28. And one meet, you know, could I build it? Well, you know, of course, you don't turn work away. Yeah, I can build it. Uh, I didn't realize this would take years. I didn't, the man died before we could formalize a contract. But I had already started the research and I'm looking into its history and I was, I guess you could say I was smitten because this aircraft is amazing in so many respects. So I started researching it seriously, uh, going in depth, and you're gonna see a little bit of what all I learned for that. Let's see if I get this right here. Come on, go oh, here. There we go. The aircraft was designed by a man named Gustave Delange. 
He was a chief engineer for Newport at the time. He developed and designs for the Newports 11, 12, 14, 27, 23, and the 28. This is the guy that designed the aircraft that I eventually built. Um, he was a wizard at the time. He was considered, you know, uh, one of the better designers in all of the Allied that the Allies had. Um, and he had a he had a flair, as I think the French do in their manufacturing, to build good-looking airplanes. I mean, if you look at all, excuse me, you look at all the ones that he designed, and they're just good-looking airplanes, and they they function like they're supposed to. So there's our there's our there's our author, if you will, of the Newport 28. Now, Eddie Reckenbacher, I mentioned his name earlier, he flew for the 94th Aerospace. You see him there on the right. Um, Eddie, Eddie had, was known at the end of the war as the ace of vases for America. He downed 26 enemy aircraft in his time in the war and was celebrated to this day. In fact, uh, the Columbus Airport is a Rickenbacker Airport. Uh, he had ended up owning uh, the Indianapolis Speedway for a while. He ended up owning Eastern Airlines for a while. I mean, the guy was a hero to the day he died. And his accomplishments are legendary and well written. And he and I share one common trait. We're both the same height. So when I'm working on this airplane, for me to figure out where do, how low or how high do I sit in the aircraft, or how long do I, you know, are my legs going to be, I have him as a model. So you can see here where his shoulder is at in the, in the cockpit, and where my shoulder is at in the cockpit are pretty darn close here. So he was my model for how that all worked out. Oh, and that's me in the, on the left, by the way, in case you hadn't figured that out. There again, Eddie Rickenbacker with his Newport 28. And Lieutenant Howard White with his Newport 28, if you will, all set to go. And you can see here how close we match the sizes here and where we're at. So again, Eddie was my, my model, and it worked out great. Whoops. Now, there were no, there are no plans for this. The original drawings and specifications have all been lost to time, which is unfortunate. So for me, I mean, there's, there's sketches, you get pieces of, uh, of a puzzle others have researched over the years. But there's no set of plans, there's no kit for this thing. <clears throat> I was fortunate to go, uh, to get into the restoration sheds at the Air Force Museum in Dayton, Ohio. They had recently pulled their aircraft off display for restoration. Um, in fact, I had gotten permission to go uh, to this, I wanted to just get behind the kick line so I could take some photos of some areas I didn't know anything about. And they called me the day before I left, that by the way, I hope you don't mind, but we pulled the aircraft out for restoration, would that be all right? I'm thinking, gosh, yeah, that would be great. I get to see it in detail. So here we are photographing. I had a whole list of questions of what to look for and how do they do this, how do they do that? And I took probably about 700 some odd pictures of the aircraft in the original Newport 28 from 1917 that they were going to restore. So you see me here looking at you know, how ribs were joined to spars and how ribs were cut out. This one is interesting. Uh, this is a wingtip. Uh, and, and one of the things I focused on here, let's see if I can do it with a laser here. These brackets, these gussets here, intrigued me because I wanted to know how do they connect the wingtip to the spars and the leading and trailing edge? How do they keep that from, there's not much material there. These gussets were the key. And I noticed, look how nice they're made. They're not just triangular pieces of wood. They're, they're a little craftsmanship there to it. Here again, this is a long time ago. This is 1993, by the way, so I, that's why you see this younger, good-looking guy, so the old, old white guy you got in front of me here. But you know, checking out how they, how they attached things, how they were done. Lots and lots of pictures, lots of details of how all this was, was put together. All this done at the restoration sheds at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. Well, I was so grateful for them to let me come back there and be with them and help them take the airplane apart and answer my questions. And then, you know, we had questions together to, to, to go through. So I got a very good fundamental understanding of what it took to put this airplane together. So here we are. My shop, I built the airplane in the basement of my house. Now, I want you to notice that the door in the back there. Oh, sorry about that. I didn't mean to do that. The door in the back, right here, is only 26 inches wide. That's the only way to get out of the basement. I don't want you to think I built this and then, oh my gosh, how am I going to get it out? <laughs> because I knew that door would not allow that. So 
there's later pictures you'll see, I did excavate out and put in a, a large double wide set of doors <coughs> and new steps so I could get this out eventually. But here we are, we are building the spars. And, and, and this is a great picture to tell you that you never have too many clamps. There's just no such thing as too many clamps. So this thing is clamped to pieces as we're, as we're, we're assembling the, 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 uh, the spars. There is a considerable amount of handwork in, in, the, in the construction of this. So what I'm doing here with hammer and chisel, if you will, is I'm clearing away part of the cap strips on the top of the wings, on the ribs, <coughs> to make room for leading edge sheeting that's going to go there so it fits flush. So there's not you know, plywood on top of and leaving a ridge there. We want that flush mounted. So we trim that whole edge down exactly where it's going to be. And not every rib is the same. So you have to fit it. I don't want gaps. So it all gets done by hand, which is kind of neat. Because I, I, I realize at this point when I'm doing this, and I see what was done 100 years earlier, that I'm doing the same thing some poor guy did at Newport. There was a, there was a, a sort of like, like a kinship. There was a feeling there that I'm in their footsteps doing what they did 100 years earlier. And it was really amazing. It caused me to stop for a while. Whoa, you know, there could be some guy named Louis standing right next to me here. <laughs> so you see here we're putting the, the ribs, are, uh, the rib, the cap strips are being assembled again. The thing with the, with the clamps. Um, see the decorations of my basement here. We're building this on top of a pool table, by the way, which is the largest level surface I had in the basement. So we just extended a, a work table off of that. Now, you remember that picture from earlier I showed you the gussets. Same thing here on the, on the same wing. I formed my gussets in the same, not exactly the same detail, but that's, that's my, my little detail there. So you'll never see it. It's all covered up. But somebody, someday, is going to pull that apart, take a look and say, hey, you know what? You put a little extra detail on that. Wasn't necessary, but that's the kind of craftsmanship that I saw in the original. And what the heck, let's do the same thing. <coughs> Excuse me. This is the first wing we completed, the first major component that was done. <coughs> Excuse me. It is the lower right wing. The wingspan on this aircraft is 26 feet and some odd inches. So it got kind of big. Now that it's done, it's all it's all varnished, it's all completely ready to go, ready for, ready for covering. But I'm not ready for covering, I've got more to build yet, so this is going to get wrapped up and stored. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> It'll get wrapped up and stored until we're ready for final assembly. One of the changes that I made, now mind you, in my research, this aircraft had inherent problems that had to be solved over time. One of them was that the fabric would peel off at a high speed dive of the upper wing, leaving the, the pilot with no real upper wing to work with. So the fact they made it back alive is a tribute to the lower wing holding on, and they were able to get down. <coughs> there was a fix for that, which I incorporated because I had the reports on that. The other thing I found in my research was a lot of pilots who crashed their aircraft didn't die because they were gunned down and died from their wounds. But on impact, the ash used in the fuselage would splinter like a ball, baseball bat. And you know how they, they, they split with the points? Well, that's what ash does. And these pilots would be severely injured or killed by being shish kebab by their own aircraft. I did not want that fate should I go down. <laughs> and that seemed a risk I did not want to take. So I substituted ash for 4130 uh, steel. steel, which means I had one of the weld, which was fine. Because it just so happens that where I was working at the time took on a job for welding, and I was the inspector, and I told the boss, look, if you want me to inspect welding, I better know how to weld and what to look for. So he sent me to welding school so I could build my airplane, is what it boiled down to. So we, had, we learned that, and it was a lot of fun to do that. So there we are, we're welding. And one of the things I, I should mention is the FAA requires you, they don't require inspections throughout the process. They require you to document your construction and specifically inspection points that they can't see that will be covered up later. So I took a lot of pictures as we're building this so the FAA could see what I was doing. So you get an idea here of what this fuselage is looking like. Again, you see the visa steps. I mean, we're, we're packed in kind of tight, but by God, we're going to build an airplane. 
question. Yes, sir. Is is the metal heavier than the wood? <coughs> no, it, it is a bit, but we're using thin wall and smaller diameter. Okay. The same structure. Where the ash would be two inch square most of the time of the entire length. Wood, and ash is not a light wood, as you know, okay? It's a very dense wood. It's great for ball bats and furniture. <coughs> I reduced the size. I could, obviously, I'm not going to apply a two inch pipe. You know, that doesn't make sense. And I worked with aircraft most of my career. So I have other modern day aircraft, such as Pipers and Huskies and AV, uh, AVLs and so on, that will, they use steel tube fuselages. So I said, okay, what are they using? You know, if they're keeping their structure strong and light with steel tube, what's their diameters? So it's easy for me to go and measure these things that here's what I need. I was only curious because if you're building the same airplane, you wouldn't want to have extra weight compared Oh no, to you want to keep things light. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. There was, there was a weight limit I was trying to stay within, and I came very close. Okay. I came in very close, absolutely. So when I'm done with the fuselage here, this is, this is it, this is all completed here. You can see the center line running down the plywood there, so I'm trying to, I was a sixteenth of an inch off when I was done. And I thought, you know what, I won't tell the airplane that, and they won't know, and I think we'll be just fine. And it worked out. You know, to this, I never did tell them, you know, that it was not exactly true. You can see at the front there, that ring there, that's, that's the firewall bulkhead former that, that's being uh, fitted as well. This was, I learned, you know, I learned how to form metal, you know, these complex shapes. I just, I thought, I would never in my life thought I'd ever have to learn that kind of stuff to, to do that. But the things you have to learn to do this stuff is just, it's problem solving. How do I make this happen? Who can tell me? Who, should, who knows what, what's, uh, you know, you practice, build prototypes, lots of prototypes. I built a prototype fuselage before, so I could figure out where the seat goes, where the rudder bar goes, how high, you know, all the dimensions there, out of just basic lumber yard material. 84 Lumber and I were very close for a long time. Come in, buy some stuff, build a, you know, a prototype, build a prototype wing. Do I have the skills? Can I bend that wing tip? You know, can I do all this stuff? So prototypes are great. That keeps me from a whole lot of scrap. <clears throat> and you can see here, <clears throat> there's a prototype seat made out of, you know, cardboard, cut up boxes. How's it going to fit? Where's, you know, where, where are my attached points going to be? You know, so that's all, all prototype. And in the back, in the very back here, you can see what's left of the back end of a prototype fuselage. Just so I didn't have to build the whole thing, just where I'm going to sit and all the pieces are going to go. So I'm a big believer in prototypes. Absolutely. Oh, bless your heart for that. <coughs> Excuse me, man, while I get rid of this hairball that's bothering me. There are three things on this aircraft that I did not build. I did not build this engine that went on it. I did not build the propeller, and I did not build the wheels. But when the engine came in, it just deserved its own picture when it finally got here. And this is a Russian radial, a, four, a nine cylinder Russian radial. The diameter was exactly what I needed. The price was right. And my wife helped me get this, which is very important because, you know, she got roped into this. You know, that was not part of the deal. She didn't know about it, but, you know, okay. So this, this is a, in itself, it's a marvel of engineering, this engine. I mean, I, I loved it. It's, there's no battery to start it. It started with compressed air, and there is a, compressor built onto the accessory case that's driven by the engine when it's running that fills up a reservoir, a, a, a bottle, that compresses the air so when you stop some place and got started again, you've got compressed air over there all the time. And the reason they did that is because, as we know, Siberia gets very cold, northern China gets very cold, batteries don't do well in the severe cold, and they solve the battery problem by use, developing an air start. And it really makes a neat little chuffing sound <laughs> as the blades go around until it catches catches up and fires off, but it's a, it's a neat, neat engine. And they're, they're designed like, they're built like tanks. And they're, they're not designed for longevity. They just built millions of these things because they want to swap them out quick. Now, one of the interesting features about this thing, and I don't want to go on it all day, but do you notice these wires, these cables here that hold the valve covers on? It's one piece of nine strand cable. It's one continuous loop. There's no weld to put the two ends together. It took me a while to figure out how they did this, but there's a machine somewhere in Russia that spins these things in one continuous loop 
and tucks the ends into itself. It's, it's really neat. So we got our engine in, so we know we're getting serious now. The wheels came in a couple weeks later. They were made by a guy down in Texas that does this for you know replica aircraft and museums. So I got my wheels in. I was very excited about getting those in. And you notice here, oh, again, how oh, good. I've put brakes on my aircraft. The reason I did this, if you look back at any of the old films you see on, on, on this time period, it takes a team to get an airplane in the air. The guy's in the cockpit, he's ready to fly, the engine's running, and they've got to taxi out and get into the wind. And who's there to help them do that? There's a guy on each wingtip, and some guy's going to be the anchor pivot as it swings around, and this guy pick up a tail because there's no tail wheel there, there's just a skid. And I just didn't see it was going to make any sense for me to duplicate that and say, hey guys, friends, I want to go fly today, could you all come out and get me launched? You know, so we modernized it with hydraulic brakes and a tail wheel on our skid. Rather than realize, because now, and by the way, don't go away for the next hour, I'll be back. And you have to be there to recover me. So it just made sense in modern aviation with runways and not wide open fields to have brakes and a tailwheel and uh, make things a little bit easier on yourself. It's not a very big disc. <laughs> it's not, but I don't have a lot of weight to stop. And I'm trying to, you know, so it was a two puck hydraulic piston. You know, and I, when I talked to the guys who manufacture this, they, oh, you know, you know clean the wheels and brakes. <coughs> Knowing what I've got, so here's what, here's what you need. Okay. And, and I'm fine with it, and it worked perfect. All right, so now we've moved from the basement to the family room. We've moved the furniture out. It's the, only, the biggest room I got in the house. And the reason why, you see the seat's all completed and mounted where it's going to go. You see the wings are all there. The only reason this is up here is because I need to know exactly where these the main struts are attached to the fuselage. And the only way to do that, in my mind, was to assemble the whole thing in one piece and, and mark them down and clamp them down. You can see clamps on there to hold them in place until I get it all disassembled and back downstairs where the welder's at, and I can weld the attached brackets where these things go in the right position, the right angles, the right height, and all that. So that's what this is for in the living room, the family room, which my youngest daughter thought it was hysterical. You can see how tight we are. We're running up against the window here, pushing the curtain aside. There's, you know, and she, it was in the, it was in this room for about two weeks to get this all sorted out. And she thought that was hysterical. She would bring, she would get home from school before I got home from work, and she'd bring friends over who could not believe that we had an airplane in our family room. And they would, and I would come home, there'd be, oh, who's this? Oh, this is my really good friend. What's your name again? You know, coming in to see this. But they thought she was kidding. But there's an airplane in our family room. There, only for a couple weeks. It would never happen in my house. <laughs> well, I was I fortunate. Not handle that. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've, I've seen some builders um, where the spar of the aircraft was poking through the wall into the dining room, and then the wife just put a dog on it and a plant until he was done. You know, he was patched all the plant. I mean, the things you go through for this stuff, you know, was was pretty amazing. Ninety six. Turnbuckles yeah. on this fuselage. This is this is all, all the turnbuckles. I don't have the engineering expertise to know that the truss that I built out of steel was sufficient. I stayed with what the original had. So all of this is wire braced with turnbuckles and so on, just like it was in 1917. I find out later that I have seriously overbuilt this fuselage, but I don't care. Okay, it <coughs> adds some weight. I get that. But I know it's not going anywhere, you know. So it's exactly the way it looked in 1917, except for not ash and, and uh, steel too. My youngest daughter got very good at safety wire and turnbuckles. Some of those are in spots a little bit too tight for these big hands to use, and uh, so she could get right in there. A little sh another shot of it here. I just I, I took this picture. And I just thought this looks so good. All the all the all the the cables there. It's also, you can tell here, that I, this is the tail end, and the front end has its own as well. It's a rotisserie, so that I can rotate the fuselage to work on stuff without having to reposition the table or anything else here. It makes it much easier to roll it left or right at that time. It's, uh, to me, that's, that's, uh, that was, it would not have worked otherwise if we didn't get to do that. Now we're starting to add our formers here. Um, Given the fuselage, it's, it's round in shape that it's supposed to have. 
And we've got more uh, formers here. All kids are, are, are going in, being placed. The cabane is still there. You see, we're starting to get them cross braced, and the formers are going in. Yards are mounted. They'll come off before we cover everything up, of course, but I want to make sure everything is mounted here. Now, I gotta, I gotta tell you a little story about, about, about the machine guns. They're Vickers 303s. Those aren't real Vickers 303s. I, one of you could get them, they're way outside my price range, and they weigh a lot, and I'm not going for that level of authenticity. I just want everybody to think that's all real, you know? So these are built out of aluminum plate, downspout, whatever I need to get my hands on to make it right. But the plans to build them came from, well, they came from Colt Manufacturing. Colt was building these during the war under license. And the way I know that is, I went to the, I was at the Aberdeen Proving Ground in Maryland at their museum there, and they had an example on display of a real aircraft Vickers 303. And I, the director was in, and it's a small museum, so he's kind of right at the front desk as well. And I asked him if he had any plans for that. I said, no, but I got a, a, an operating manual. Okay, take what you can get. So he, he made a copy for me, he starts a copy of it, and on the very inside it says, manufactured under license by Colt Manufacturing, Hartford, Connecticut. I know where their people are at, so I call them up. This is before 9-11, okay? And there's, there's two menus, there's two items on the menu. You want sales or you want historic? Ah, historic. And this, this, this older lady is on the phone. I can tell by her voice, she's not 20. And I ask what I'm looking for, she's, and she says, where do I send it? I need I, I, do you have plans? Where do I send them? Okay, how much is it going to cost? Just where do I send them? Okay, give her an address. Two weeks later, I get a tube of machinist drawings that if I had the skill, I could build this thing for real. But it gave me what I needed for dimensions and so on to make this thing. This Again, this was before 9-11. I think if you called Colt Nash for that, they, they <laughs> called the FBI now. But So we built them to those plans. They are propane operated. Yeah, they, they, they make noise. They make a big racket. I mean, it's amazing. And I, and I can adjust the rate of fire on a rheostat that's, that's built inside. And they shoot out flame about eight or nine inches inside. And then the first time I fired them off the house, I thought I was going to be dead for the rest of my life. I didn't realize. So you take them outside and shoot this. And I, and I took them outside one time to, to fire them off just to get all the timing right. Because, you know, they, they may be fakes, but I want it to sound right, you know. Mm -hmm. And... I'm in a subdivision at the time, and I've got these guns spread out <laughs> on a picnic table, and I'm rattling these things off, and I'm jumping up and down, and I'm excited because it sounds so cool, and they're echoing off the houses behind me, and I'm, you know, kids used to go through the backyard, and I'm watching for kids coming through, and out of the corner of my eye, I see some movement, so I shut everything down, and a police officer comes around the corner with his hand on his sidearm, and he's got a report of somebody firing an automatic weapon in the neighborhood. And he was sent to one guy who was sent out to investigate this. I felt so sorry for him. So somewhere in the police archives is a report of a of a local guy firing off, you know, these propane fired guns, and it wasn't really an automatic weapon. But I got in a little bit of a conversation there with a guy who, you know, I was done. I wasn't going to make a habit of this, but you know, I was surprised that anybody cared enough. It makes such a racket. Which comes in handy later, by the way. All right, so here you see we've got one of the modifications that the later Newports made uh, was to put this fuel tank here. This is the, up here you can see the little crease, there's this oil tank there, there's a main fuel tank, feeds into a saddle tank. This tank, saddle tank used to be under the pilot's seat. And the pilots didn't like that. That's like sitting on top of a bomb. An incendiary bullet goes through there, the, you know, the airplane's going to shoot you from, from, from below, and you've got no protection, so they moved it here. So the fuel system then is draining from this main tank into this saddle tank, and then it goes right out to the edge of the carburetor at that point. So it is the lowest feed, it's all gravity feed. Um, I, I love you know, I love welding this because everybody always, oh, aluminum, welding aluminum is so hard. It's, you know, it's, not a, it's not. It's not that hard. I just, you know. I love this picture, and it's just, it's just all the symmetry, I guess. Another view here, everything mounted up, everything fitted where it's supposed to go. We're getting close now. This is, this is where you can start to say, you know, I'm almost, I can see it as an airplane at this point. Working on the tail assembly, again, this thing with our, our, our tubing, uh, it's easier to work with. The uh, original used an all wood structure. <clears throat> but they also have problems with structural issues. 
with it. So I, I again, I had the reports on that, and the mods they went through were extensive. They never did solve the problem. So I went with this, which really wasn't really available to them at the time. And welding was not unknown, but the manufacturer manufacturing style welding, get it, you know, because you're cranking these things out. The Germans did a good job with it. The Allies were a little bit far behind. Here is where we have the upper and lower wing install. Upper and lower wing, oh, I am so sorry. Well, I'm still doing <coughs> we, are, we are fitting these interplane struts. Make sure that the angle with the cabanes and the instance and everything are all exactly the same. There's nothing more aggravating to me to look down a, a light in the wing and see everything is skewed, not true. So I want them true before we get too far down the line. So you can see this is what we're fitting here. This picture I like because I did a really good job on this. <laughs> this is the aileron bell crank assembly for the left wing. And what I really am proud of is I bent this tube without a single wrinkle or kink in it anywhere. It's flawless. Both of them work. But I was so tickled with myself that I did this because I'd seen so many, even on production aircraft, where there was a bend or kink in the <coughs> bend somewhere, you know, in it. And, and, and I'm bragging, I get it, but it's perfect. <laughs> it deserved its own picture, in my opinion. So... Yeah, and we, one of the things we've added here, you might be able to see a little bit here, there is a nylon washer here, so that I've got very little friction to work with. There's no real good access to keep that well oiled and grease, so we put a, we build a nylon washer in this. Uh, they've got them all throughout the entire assembly up to the bolts. These are all just dry fitted right now. But, uh, and you can see this is the, where it controls the, the uh, aileron uh, control surface right there through that tube. That's why that picture's there. This is the first time we put it all together as one piece. Does everything really fit? You know, you measure and you measure and you measure and you hope it all does. Maybe it fit in the basement, but now it goes outside. And I was surprised how many little things didn't fit right when we finally got to this stage. And you can see from the weather, it was a rainy day. And this is the only day that all these guys could come help me do this. And the rain was supposed to be like 10% chance. Well, not in my driveway. You know, so how we got this thing out of the basement, put it all together, and I... You know, just by itself, I think it, it, I should stop there because I think the, the structure is just amazing. It looks so nice. Howard. Yes. Did, is, did you have to weigh the left side with the right side maybe before you put it together, or you didn't really have to do that? I did that on the lower wing, so they were finished first. And I was within like a pound. So I'm using the same material, the same jigs, the same fixture. You know, all this is being done. So I figured, you know, I, I can't fuss it. I can't make it any lighter, you know. I don't know why this one weighs a little more than the other. Maybe there's an extra inch of steel torque tube here somewhere. I don't know. But no, I did not. I would do that on a model aircraft in a heartbeat. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's too yeah. important. But full size, if I'm off a little bit on one side, if it's going to cause me a problem, I'll trim it out. Yeah, yeah. You know, that's all there is to it. Mm -hmm. But no, I did not go to that extent. The lower wings I did the one time, and I said, you know, I can live with a pound. It was, it was not quite a pound, but it was different. Yeah, you yeah. know, and was it because of moisture? Because of you know, I don't know know what caused that difference. Just another view. I figure why you got it like this. Take some pictures. It's going to get covered up soon enough as it is. All that, all that beautiful. There is the first time I get to sit in and make engine noises. <laughs> it's a hot, rainy day, as you can tell. We're soaked. You know, we, we would stop ready, we'd pull the plastic off, we'd finish it up, get it in. This is also where we started making our cables as well. While it's assembled, we start making our flying wires, our landing wires, our drag cables, and so on, to get them right. So that's the first time I got to sit in. Now you can see here, this is a compressed air reservoir bottle I was telling you about that the engine is constantly feeding. Fuel level tank here, pressure gauge here. What you can't see is, is behind here somewhere there's a uh, pressure relief valve. If I hit, if I exceed 800 psi in that bottle, it just pops off. So, because the compressor doesn't know, it's it's rotating all the time. But I needed to have some way of making sure that extra pressure was relieved. There's very little instrumentation on this aircraft. As you can see, we've got our RPM gauge. Our tack is there. This is our um, oh, shoot, I forget. Oil pressure, oil temp, <laughs> and 
and I've uh, I've drawn a major mental blank here. Can I read it? It's not an altimeter. I don't remember. It'll, it'll come to me, and I'll tell you. I'll call you at three in the morning. And tell you what it is. <laughs> but this is the floor. Um, there wasn't much in these in these aircraft for creature comforts. They were designed for combat. They were designed for one thing only, and that was a shoot down. So it's not a cross country aircraft. You don't want to get in here and and say, "Oh, let's go to Cape May for the day." It's not that kind of aircraft. You wouldn't like it at this point. But uh, yeah, it's it's pretty Spartan. Not much there at all. Back in the basement we go. Because now we have to fit this sheathing. By the way, this is called hoop pine. It comes from Australia. It's very thin and very flexible in one direction. So if you got it in the right direction, it will bend almost back on itself with a very tiny radius, very small radius, just a couple inches. And it's great for doing what we're doing now. In the original, they use a uh, masonite type material. Uh, a lot of glue there was very heavy and they would form it and let it sit there before they actually attached. Uh, we have better materials to give you the same, uh, same effect here. <coughs> so since the fuselage is conical shaped, there's no real straight lines that you can just mark out. So everything has to be fitted. Each piece for me, as one guy, had to be fitted custom to get that to work around. We're going to go to our first air show. Will it get into the truck? <laughs> We're discussing that right now because we've got it outside of the basement, which was a, a story in itself getting out of the basement. It took a team of us shoving this thing out the door. Several hundred pounds going up steps, didn't want to go. And we're figuring out, geez, I mean, you can see, the one guy in the red shirt, he scratched his head like, what the hell are we going to get in here? It got in there. We made it. We got in there. It was a close one. It wasn't, it was almost too high, almost too wide at the landing gear axles, but we had about an inch on everything to, to spare. We, we got it in there. It was the biggest, tallest truck we could get, but you never know until you actually try it. That's what it boils down to. So, our first public appearance was at Ryder Patterson Air Force Base for their World War I rendezvous in 2002, I think it was. Uh, they do, do, I don't know if they still do them, they did them every other year for quite a while. And I have gone to several of them to see what people were doing with their, what, what makes that airplane stand out? What, what they do that really solved the problem? And some of it was pretty interesting, and that's where I got the hydraulic brakes, uh, the disc brakes on the wheels. There, there was a, another guy who did the same thing, and I talked to him, and that made perfect sense to me. Need some modification to fit and not look too obtrusive. But there's our first public appearance. There I am reading the paper. It's early morning, everything's still wet out there. You can see other aircraft on the flight line. And interesting about, you know, they, they kind of made a special place. They made a three-angled a three rectangle for me to sit in, to give you some detail. Now, the decals here, again, I, I had worked with the restoration team at Wright Pat previously, okay? And I called up one of the guys one time and asked him, you know, look, I, I, how did you duplicate these decals? <clears throat> well, on their original, there was still several of various degrees of deterioration left. So they carefully scraped, and he had one left over. He had an envelope in his toolbox. It was about 70% complete. And I took that, he gave it to me. He, I took that and I went to a, a, a vinyl graphics guy. I said, can you do this? Can you make this for me? Here's the size. Can you fill in this? And, yeah, one pixel at a time. It was a little, <laughs> it took time, but one pixel at a time. He said he was able to put each color where it belonged, and when he was done, we had, I bought a stack of them. I figured, you know, what's costing me? I want more than just one or two, you know. So they're obviously where they belong, and they're exactly the way they were designed back in 1917. They're beautiful. And probably the most comments I got on the aircraft was other oh, things. Where did you get the decals? <laughs> Where did you come? You're always looking for those details. This is what makes the, re the re reproductions so authentic looking is the detail. So there's my decals, and you can see everything's lined up, which is what I'm looking for. And I, you would be surprised how many people would come up to me and ask me, how does it fly? Do you notice there's no fabric on the wings? And I, but you know, I couldn't explain, so you know, flies great. And then they'd be happy. That's all there was to it. You, 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 there were, 
You don't argue with the public. Just, <laughs> just give what they want. It flies great. I used to see it. It's a lot of fun. Absolutely. They would walk in. This, you know, I don't know if it ever dawned on them or not. I had, a, I had a gentleman come one time with this friend, and he was swerving down. The engine I had on the front was not the engine that I said it was. It was something else, and he was telling his friend all about that engine. That's what that is. And he, you're wrong. And I'm thinking, like, you know what? Thank you for telling me, because I had no clue what it is I put on the front of that airplane. The other thing I learned, too, very quickly when I was going to these shows, is if you're going to color an airplane the way someone else did, this is going to be Eddie Rickenbacker's airplane, there are people going to tell you that's not right. That is the way he did it. You know, and they, they'll just come all over it. So what I did is I made sure that this was Lieutenant Howard White's airplane, no one else's. And I actually had a poster up front that would tell you, you know, all about Lieutenant Howard White and his, you know, his airplane. So the insignia belongs to the 27th Air Squadron, a real squadron, a very famous squadron. Uh, Frank Luke, the balloon buster, was part of his, that was, he was part of that group. <coughs> um, everything else is uh, color. The, the camouflage, the five color camouflage pattern is spelled out in, in uh, single core orders on how they want it done. It's all painted by hand. There's no spray painting. They had the technology, but they didn't want that. They wanted it painted by hand. Here is our finished seat and seat belts. Control stick, um, these buttons here control each of the guns. Um, press those buttons and things get loud real quick, which is a lot of fun. Now I am determined to find what that instrument is up there. Airspeed. RPM, airspeed, oil fresh, oil temp pressure gauge for the, the compressed air. Of course there's speed. I'd like to know how fast I'm going. I don't care how high I am, it's just how fast are we going. I needed to have that for test information. So that's the finished cockpit. Everything's all installed, ready to go. Throttle quadrants, mixtures are all on the left-hand side where they belong. And uh, surprisingly, when you get in it, it it's, it's a snug fit, but it's a comfortable fit. The seat's relatively, I know it's a hard plywood bottom, but it's not that uncomfortable. But again, you wouldn't be want to be in it for you know hours and hours. Again, the 27th Aero Squadron, the Screaming Eagles. I had this done uh, by some artist friends of mine. Um, and they I had pictures and I had colors. But the Wright Patterson, the museum, has actual examples in their file of many squadron insignias. So I was allowed to go look at theirs. It's in a glass uh, folder, if you will, you pull the glass plates, and there it is, and I can get the, the colors. And then match them in here and, the, and what it's done like. And I noticed <coughs> on the original example they had, you could still see the pencil marks where the mechanic drew out before he painted. Mm -hmm. So I told my artist friends, here's a picture of what it is, here are the colors that go where, here's how big I want it. And they said, well, you know, I want it to look like the airplane we got delivered that night and it's going on patrol tomorrow morning, which is often what took place. So they came in and they took about a week to do it, okay? And on the original, you can still see pencil lines, just like you do on the original. I mean, it was amazing. What they couldn't do, what the one guy couldn't, what the husband could not do, he said, Howard, I just can't be that crude. He's a fine artist. <laughs> so the lettering looks like it was done by print. I mean, it's so accurate. It's so finely done. I just can't make it look rough, you know? Okay, Ernie, we can live with that, you know? That's fine. So, we have that. Each pilot was allowed one insignia. Uh, some had war bond posters. Um, this is a Christie poster, a replica, a reproduction, and I had that mounted on mine as well. Now, there were several pilots that had this poster on their aircraft, but they all had theirs mounted on the upper wing. Lieutenant Howard White put his on the lower wing. I didn't want to get trapped into the last not the way they did it, this is the way this was done. It's time to put fire brick on the wings now. Let's get them covered up. So in the living room, we're in the basement here, sewing it down. Get it down. It took 700 some odd stitches to get all the, all the wings sewn up to do that. But after a while, you get into a rhythm. You know, you just stay with that rhythm. Now we're in the living room because it's, it's big enough. The family room was put back together. I don't need all that space. And we're painting, putting the final colors on. Uh, in this case, the lower portion of the lower wing here. Now, 
In the 27th Aero Squadron, there was no aircraft numbered 12. We know this. We have photographic proof of what the numbers were. So I chose 12. <coughs> Final assembly, getting all the cables rigged, ready to go. We're working now towards our, our test flight at this point. We're getting ready for this. So again, it takes a team to string all these cables, get the tensions right. And you, you, I, you may have read accounts perhaps where the wires sing in flight. Well, if they're tensioned right, they do make a noise. If they're not tensioned right, they make a thrumming sound. And you can see them vibrating. So you, you get back there and say, okay, we need a little tighter. It's not that they're unsafe, unless they're slacking up and down, but you wouldn't fly them with a slack anyhow. But you get them as tight as you think to where you say, gee, we're going to pull something out of here. And then you go fly and find out they're still not tight enough. Once you get them tight right, they, they do make a little a tone. They do. Figuring out where they go, he's checking the tension there, the guy in the middle there, checking the tension on the cable. Of course, we're sharing the hangar with another airplane. We finally got inspected. There's our paint slip for airworthiness. The two FAA inspectors were good friends of mine, came and did the inspection, and they were very thorough. They had followed the progress of this for a number of years, so it wasn't a new airplane that they'd been there many times to see how it was coming. So they were more than happy, and I'm very grateful that they did that. I didn't have to pay a DER to come do this. But there we got our airworthiness certificate. We were ready to go. Ready to start our test flight program. This is the final product when we were done. Everything's all set. We made a, our propeller was walnut, just like the original. You can't really see where the brakes are on the landing gear. They're, they're not invisible, but you know, if you know where to look, you can see them, but the colors all match. They're, they're slim. <coughs> our first flight, we had the test flight done by a friend of mine named Andrew King who flew, he and his father flew a lot, of, a lot of aircraft at Rhinebeck, New York, at their museum there. Uh, so he did the first test flight. This is my first flight, up and away. And one of the things I noticed uh, when I took this first flight, one, it's a great flying airplane, it's very stable. But there's no visibility below you because there's a wing in the way. And that made it tough for me when I made my first flight because the plan was just circle the airport. Don't get too far from home. <coughs> Only. I can't find the airport, <laughs> and I'm circling, and I can't see it, and I know it's there, but I can't see it, and I'm getting a little bit a little anxious here because this is, this I want to get home now, you know? And finally, I just scooted out to the side further, and there it was, and I was okay because I could find home now because the wing had blocked it in its entirety, on the entire circle, no matter where I looked, the airport was, <clears throat> was blocked. So you, you navigate to the side. <clears throat> Unless you're level, you, looking out front doesn't help you any. So you're looking on either side to see where things are at. <laughs> Not all things were glorious, though. In 2005, in September 2005, we had an engine failure shortly after takeoff, and this is the result. I often wondered what this guy's thinking. <laughs> you know, he's on the highway there, right, Patterson. We were, that, was a, that was a hard day. That was my wife's introduction to air crashes. She was there. She got to watch that happen. Weren't you excited? <laughs> is that picture taken right when it happened? Yeah, yeah, that's 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 live. That's when it happened. You'd be surprised how many people have offered me the pictures of my crash <laughs> when I got back. Yeah, wheel going. Oh yeah, yeah. That's the only thing I really remember about this is the wheel flying past me. <laughs> I don't remember. Oh, oh yeah, I don't remember the goggles flying off. I don't hit, remember my face hitting the windscreen. None of that. We ended up upside down. This is the one time I was very glad that I had a steel construction. For the rudder, I built it so if I did get in this position, it would not collapse and put me in a possible fatal uh, position. Um, yeah, I did this in front of tens of thousands of people at the air show. The FAA was there, the Air Force was there. <coughs> yeah, I mean, I shut the whole thing down, got front page news for this one. Where was it at? Right, Patterson Air Force Base, Dayton, Ohio. Uh, where we were flying off of it was a uh, disused <coughs> section of the run of a complex where the B-52s would take off. The B-52s mm -hmm. aren't stationed there anymore. Mm -hmm. So this is one of the areas that the museum has, I would say, not confiscated, but mm -hmm. taken for their own. So there are a lot of events that are held in this particular area. And we're just, we're flying off of the grass in between the taxiway and the runway. Mm -hmm. it's, it's an amazing complex. So we've got to rebuild it. Ten years later, I figure out it's time to rebuild this thing. So we're doing a, a, a final fit before we finish all the fabric up, make sure everything a lot of new cables, 
Uh, not very much structural damage was done. One of the things I noted that, uh, that of the wood that broke, none of the glue joints <coughs> broke. They held, every single one. And to me that was important because I was using a non-standard adhesive. Mm -hmm. It met the ASTM 273 standard, but nonetheless it wasn't one of the FA approved. It's your, your own manufacturer, and they let you do this because you know what's best for your aircraft. I use a, a I use Type Bond. And it, every single joint held. Now you, you smack me to the ground on what I did, they held, I'm pretty, pretty confident that we did the right thing with that. All right, it's bright sunny out. We're all a bunch of old guys in there trying to put this airplane together, most of which had never seen it assembled first and had no idea where things go. But I think that I like this shot here. That all the structure is out again for us to take a look at. One more. There we go. Obviously, without the wheels, it stands much taller. I, th I was always amazed how big it got when you kept putting it together. It takes up a lot of space. So in 2015, in September, we went back to Wright Pack with our finished aircraft. Um, didn't fly it. At that point, I, I lost my medical. Uh, but it was done. And we were back together and you go back. It was nice to go back. I mean, the guys are still there. You know, and this is quite a small group of people who, who do this. but. Enthusiastic, you got. I mean, it's it's, a, it's important. So, you know, a, a side story here. I built this, go along with it, obviously for display. <clears throat> and I finally, after all these years, this summer, I thought, you know, what? I ought to fly this thing. I mean, I, I built it to fly, so I, I got it all ready to go to fly. And wouldn't you know, I crashed that sucker on takeoff too. <laughs> <laughs> Sold it too. I had, I had it. You go ahead and get it. This is what it's done. This is the finished product after we were rebuilt, totally rebuilt. That's it. All essentially, it's all brand new again. Everything is all set and ready to go. Just another view. It's a nice flying airplane. There's no bad habits. It stalls straight and level. It has reasonable maneuverability. It's interesting to read. It's interesting to read accounts of the time that, you know, oh, the closing rate was so fast. You know, I'm hitting 110 miles an hour, and I'm thinking, I've got a 46 Lusk of 8A that does that on a 65 horsepower engine, and it's routine. But to them, it was remarkable to fly at those speeds. It was unbelievable. Oh my gosh, this one will hit 150 miles an hour. It was breathtaking for them to do this. So when I, I think of what they went through and, and the, the advantages <coughs> that they had at the time of open cockpit, a lot, of, a lot of staff to keep these things running. I mean, one of the problems they had with the original engine is it would catch fire in flight, and which is a hazard, because the fabric is so flammable, it's almost explosive. You don't want it catching flight. But the 27th, when the SPADs came available to the American squadrons, the 27th Air Squadron said, we don't want it. We figured out how to put the, fly, the fires out in flight. We like our 20s. We don't want to give them up. And they were ordered directly to surrender their 28s back into inventory and take the specs. They loved their airplanes. I mean, America's first victories were done in a Newport 28. Alan Winslow and Douglas Campbell shot down the first two aircraft over their own field. The Germans had the audacity to fly over to take a look at the Americans' new field, and two of them didn't make it back. I mean, this was, this was our airplane, even though we didn't build it. And it, uh, it's such a great flying airplane. And the other thing I noticed too, aside from the limited visibility, it is a gun platform. It is exactly what it is. And when you're looking forward, it, you, are, you are focused on the target ahead. It's the, the vision focuses you, the way everything is built. That's the only place really to look out. It's to get yourself, you are in line with your gun and there's your target. And true story, a friend of mine who lived off airport quite a ways had a, a, an ultralight. He landed on, on, on his, his air property, but he gassed up at the, at the field. And I'm coming home from a, a test flight, and I see him there, and I swing around behind him, and I close to where I thought I was comfortable, close, okay, because I'm not one of these guys that's gonna go, you know, and I let those guns go, and I, he just, I mean, you saw him, his airplane jumping, oh my God, <laughs> you know? So I follow him in, he lands first, and I land behind him, and he is giving me what for when he gets on the ground. I mean, I scared him. You know, I really, I messed him up, you know. And he was so angry at me doing that, you know. But it was so fun <laughs> to do. I mean, 
mean, that's what it was for, you know? Get those guns to rattle and scare the bejeebers, you know, it was fun. I did that to a couple other people, and eventually you get yelled at them and you kind of quit doing that, you know? But it was neat to do. It was fun. It was a Walter Mitty experience. <laughs> So yeah, I've, ta I've talked almost a whole hour. Are there any questions at all I can answer for you? It's, it's been a fun thing to, to oh, review. It's a total weight on the... the it's a little over, I think it was right about 900 pounds. Wow. I was a little over the original weight. Wow. And that, actually, strictly to the engine weight. The engine was a lot heavier. So, my but, motorcycle's dual discs. Uh, <laughs> I, I've got half that weight, and uh, I've got dual discs that are twice the diameter yeah. of those brakes. But I'm not trying to stop at a stop sign in a hurry. <laughs> You know, I'm landing and I'm putting my brakes are literally just to slow me down and give me some directional control on the ground. And that's a nine cylinder engine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It is. What's the bore? What do you? What, what's the displacement on that? I I'd have to look it up. Honestly, I don't have that. Something I don't have in the back of my mind. You know, I, I know it, I know it had a 250 horsepower rating, and okay. I derated it to 150 because that's what the original aircraft had was a, a 150 horse engine in it. I don't have the structural knowledge to know that I could build it strong enough to take the extra horsepower. So it was derated to 150 horsepower. Cool. And I did that with propeller pitch. Okay. I had power charts that told me yeah, we and what RPM power. would give me what horsepower. And I had the guy build a propeller and he knew what we were talking about. He, he knew what, what to do. So sure. He knew what pitch to bring it right into that power chart. So I'm running a 150 horsepower engine on a 150 horsepower engine. And those are aspirated, airplane. those are aspirated, uh, uh, carburetors. Yes. Uh huh. Yeah. yeah. Damn. Why? Why was that? I know you're using original uh, ideas, but why not use the runway instead of the grass? I like grass. <laughs> I really do. I mean, I. I, I I'm just, yeah. Just, it, it, just grass feel. I mean, the airplane, the Velasco that I had, uh, it loves grass. I love grass. It's much more forgiving. Yeah. I mean, we call grass grease. You get a little bit sideways on a touchdown, it just slides right there, it's fine, you know. Asphalt will jerk you to the side, you know. Yeah. I mean, I've done it, you know, obviously I have to fly it off, off the runway, but if I could do it on grass, yeah. and you know, for us when we're at Wright Pack, we're, we're pretending it's 1917 all over again. I mean, all the cars are from that era, all the, all the reenactors are from that area, era. Uh, we're not taking off on a paved runway. We're well, taking up on grass. And in 1917, there weren't any. There weren't any. Yeah, right. It was all pastures. Yeah. And you could take off in any direction. It was big squares. Mm -hmm. That's all there was to it. Mm -hmm. So no matter where the wind blew, you could take right off in the wind every single time. But uh, it, it climbed like a homesick angel. It really did. It really wanted to fly. Now, that doesn't take much of a run. Uh, no, in fact, I was surprised how fast it came off the ground. Mm. I, I mean, it really caught me by surprise. I was used to a much longer takeoff run. Yeah. And this thing leaped off the ground with about 50, 60 feet. Wow. And I've seen vintage footage of them, and that's literally, they come off the ground that quick. There's a lot of wing there, and it, you know, there's a lot of lift. It didn't take much to get off the, that was the first sensation. I was like, oh my God, I'm off the, off the ground already and climbing. You know, this, this caught me by surprise that first time. I, I, I remember that so clearly. Stick forward, it's really fun. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it was so, Fun to fly. It was so stable. It was there was no bad habits. Like I said before, there was no tricks to it. There are a lot of airplanes that have bad habits. It killed a lot of pilots. Um, you know, you've got an engine up front that's a ro rotating engine. Yeah. In the original, that had its own problems with torque and so on. I don't have that. I had a left spinning prop instead of a right turning prop. But if an airplane is an airplane, you still fly the same way. It doesn't. The airplane doesn't care. You know, and knowing that I wasn't going to go any faster than the airplane I was already flying, that made it nice. Why did the engine fail? The components, the magneto shorted out. The components that I was sold with the engine were not the right components. So the mag shorted out. Now, we have video of the actual crash live, if you will. And you can see as I'm taxiing, there's a puff of black smoke that comes out as I'm taxiing. And the FAA determined, the NTSB determined, that's where the first mag failed. Mm -hmm. But I've already done my engine run-ups for us, and I knew everything was fine. In hindsight, I should have done a second run-up as I got to the takeoff point, but I didn't. I was just doing one run-up, everything was fine, we're going to go fly. Shortly after takeoff, the second mag grounded out, and we were done. What, what's amazing is, not only did we do it in front of tens of thousands of people, but that we did it in front of the, the FAA who witnessed it, <laughs> so I don't have to explain a lot to them because they saw it. I've got film of it. I mean, it's, it made it easy to investigate. And their, their investigation really centered around the engine. It's a Russian engine, so 
There weren't a lot of those in the field at the time to determine what caused this happen. So the NTSB came to the hangar and looked it all up and found out that's exactly what it was that took place. No, the Russian engine, was that similar to what they had originally in 70? No, the original was a seven cylinder rotary radial. Oh, okay. The whole engine spun on the crankshaft. Uh, uh -huh. This was not, this was more closely related to a, a Pratt Whitney 985 five cylinder engine. The they, whole engine rotated? Yes, on? it is, it's called a rotary. Wow. It rotates. If you watch, if you see some bit of footage, you can pick it up on pathay.com and things like that. And the guy is swinging and swinging the prop, right? Well, yeah. the engine's moving right, right, right next to me. That prop is spinning, and you're looking at the prop. But look right next to him. You watch that engine, the cylinders go. All right, I want to close. We're done here. I want to close our prayer if we could. If we would, thank you. Lord, thank you so much for this opportunity to share what I and you and I work on. Lord, we ask that you grant these people whatever comfort they need and give them a safe day. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Yeah. Fascinating. Okay. Um, this week. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I am. Neat lady. Amazing woman. Yeah, no argument for me. You look like you're having fun. <laughs> Did you see the. Oh, I'm going to go to the wall. Apparently, this was full of